An obligation, the definition of obligation is that it's an act or a course of action which a person is morally or legally bound to take. I'm obliged to do that, either legally or morally, you feel a, 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 a responsibility to take a particular course of action, do a particular thing. And I want to put the question out to you to discuss over a coffee for the next 10 minutes or so. As Christians, what obligations do we have? What obligations do we have as Christians? And it's going to lead us into our teaching this morning as well, because we're back in Colossians. <laughs> and we're going to build on that this morning. We're going to just consider this as church, as people of God. What obligations are there in Scripture as children of God? Enjoyed that, and that gave you a lot to get your teeth into. Terrible if obligation was always a negative thing, wouldn't it? 
Yeah. A wedding would be a terrible thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm obliged to love my wife. <laughs> my wife is obliged to love me. That's like, is that negative? <laughs> of course it's not, isn't it? You know, that's something you're willing to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you've, you've chosen to do it. You've chosen to, to, to make a sacrificial pact in, in, a, in a wedding. And, and I think for my part, I'd like to say we could have added the word spiritually to there. And I think as Christians, what we could do is delete the word legally. Yeah, we, we haven't got any legal. Christ came and fulfilled the law, which I think is picking up on the point Fran made. Legally, and, and, and actually, I don't, I don't, I don't mind me saying, Tom said, yeah, sorry Tom, he said, you know, I don't feel it, you know, but in one sense we haven't got any obligations. And in, in a certain context, that's true. In the context of justification, we haven't got any obligations, except why well, I suppose you can't do what one, which is to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in him. That's as far as it goes. That is, from a justification point of view, it is all about believing and accepting Jesus Christ as Lord. And if you consider that an obligation, then that is the one obligation for justification. But actually, following justification comes what? Sanctification, which is becoming the process of becoming more like Jesus. And that brings with it a whole series of obligations. Like you say, to be witnesses, to love our neighbours, to help the poor, to, to put away childish things. You know, those are the sort of things that, that come out in Scripture. Uh, in, in terms of the process of sanctification and in fact this we're going to read from Colossians in a minute from chapter 3 which is what we were doing prior to sort of taking our break of teaching and testimony for, for Christmas we were looking at Colossians chapter 3 and the whole reason that Paul wrote this whole letter these four chapters as we've got them in our Bibles to Colossians to the Colossians got my teeth in to the Colossians in Colossae was the fact that they've got the cart and the horse the wrong way round. They had got these false teachings and false teachers that said, oh, you know, you know, to do, be saved, you've got to do this. And to be saved, you, you must observe this festival. And oh, oh, and you must do this and you mustn't do that. And if you don't do this, then, you know, you're, you're, you're not saved. You're not trusting God. And Paul spent, as he does in most of his letters, he spent the first half of the letter explaining that it's all about Jesus. That Jesus has done everything. He has fulfilled the law, he's paid the price for our sins, he's paid the, uh, He's made a way, restored, provided the restoration of a relationship with God through him. And therefore, and this is the word therefore that gets used many, many times in scripture. Therefore, here's some obligations. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Therefore, in view of God's love and mercy, go and, and love your neighbour as yourself. Therefore, do this. But it's not to earn justification with God. It's to become more like Jesus and to live in the fullness of what he has for us. Yeah. Now, when you read that with a sense of the word obligation, sort of headed over it, there's an awful lot in there, isn't there? There's a lot in there. Now, we spent the period again before Christmas looking really at the first four verses. And we came up with seven things that are true about us and that, that those first four verses in chapter three are in a sense a summary of chapters one and two which is why we let straight in at chapter three because we've done ephesians and we've done romans and there's a lot of paul just re-emphasizing points but you know these things are true about you whether you feel them or not it's not down to your emotions it's not down to whether you're having a good day or a bad day if you've accepted jesus christ as your lord and savior these things are true about you. You cannot work for them, earn them, or, or do anything to t take them from God and say, look what I've done, I'm worthy of these things. You come and accept that you are not worthy of them, but Jesus is giving it you as a gift, that you are raised with Christ. Christ is sat at the right hand of the Father, and you died. That is the symbolism of baptism. That, you know, when we share in his death, we don't die as a sense in physically, but we're saying we are dying to self. Uh, but that, that baptism isn't, isn't what saves you. It's actually being raised with him and having faith in him and being risen in his new life. And it's faith in the resurrection of Christ that saves you. And then and the belief and knowledge that you are hidden 
in Christ, that Christ becomes your representative before God. He is your life and represents you, knowing that whatever is now, between now and that moment, there will be a time in the future when Christ will <coughs> return in glory and he, we will appear with him. Those seven things are facts in scripture that we need to understand about ourselves before we go in to the rest of the chapter. And you know, it's really easy to, in a sense, those things are really nice to preach about. It's very uh, easy, in a sense, to preach those things. And it's very encouraging to preach those things. Often you get a lot of response of people saying, that's really encouraging, that's really helpful. I've got a friend who's, who's, who's a church leader. Uh, he only fairly recently became a church leader. And we were having quite a long conversation about um, preaching and you know, what topics to preach on and should I preach on this, you know, on a, he was sort of trying to work out, you know, his preaching program, should I preach on a topic, should I pick my favourite topic to preach on, or should I go through a book in the Bible, you know, what, what sort of approach should I take, and he, he opted for that, I'm, I'm going to come to this uh, gently, I'll, I want to take a book in the Bible, and I want to take one that isn't controversial, because I don't want to get into, you know, uh, issues like, you know, husbands and wives or you know gender and things like this and so he, I, can't, I can't honestly remember which book he picked but he picked this book and it all went well for the first couple of chapters <laughs> and then he found out and we speak a bit later says, you know there's no such thing as a book in the bible that doesn't ta tackle difficult issues and every single book in the bible tackles a difficult issue somewhere if we, we can't just preach that because Paul did this. If you look at Romans, you look at Ephesians, you look at Galatians, you look at Colossians, any of his letters, he doesn't just preach this wonderful doctrine which is true. He doesn't preach just this wonderful theology which is true. He keeps using this awful word, therefore. <laughs> therefore. So what are you going to do about it is kind of what it says. So then, fellows, what, what, what does this mean? How do we apply this? Because that doctrine is not just preached into a vacuum. It's not just preached into some sort of area where nothing happens. It would be like constantly looking at a picture of a garden, a beautiful garden, maybe one of the Royal Heart Horticultural Society's gardens, which are beautiful, aren't they? But you can look at pictures of gardens all day long. You can go to somebody else's garden all day long, but you will never end up by talking about it, what a wonderful garden it is. You will never end up with your own beautiful garden. You know, you have to pull weeds up, don't you? You have to do some work. I'm not particularly a gardener, because it's too much like hard work. <laughs> but those of you that are gardeners know that the beauty comes when you pull the weeds out and you put the work in. And Paul says, this beauty fits to shine through. There's work to do for it to shine through in your life, for it to be beautiful, for it to take effect and it to grow something. And he uses this word, therefore. And that's just the first four verses of chapter 3. But when we get into verses 5, 6 and 7, there it is. There's that word. Therefore, okay, here's the doctrine. Here's the truth. I've established and I've put before you. Go and read the first two chapters of Colossians or you can read the first three chapters of Ephesians. And Paul will always emphasise your justification is through Christ and through Christ alone. But then he asks the question. So now what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? And in different books, depending on who he's writing to, because whatever the issues are there, you get a list of things. And you'll get a list in Peter, you'll get a list in Corinthians, you get lists in Romans, you get lists in Titus, of things of what that group of people or that person needs to do to respond to the doctrine that Paul has just explained. And that list will be sort of have a context to it. And it's interesting that the Colossian society was quite sexually immoral. And so he focuses on some of the issues to do with sexual immorality with the Colossians. He says, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, and evil desires, and greed, because that amounts to idolatry. So he focuses on those for this particular group of people. And we'll look a little bit later at some of the other, we, you know, the rest of the list where he says, take off anger and malice, put on gentleness and kindness. And we'll look at those a bit later. 
But I wanted to look at this and fact, he says, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. We need to just have a little think about what that word dead means in scripture, because it's quite an emotive word to us. It obviously conjures up a, a, a thought of a funeral and a body in a coffin, or you know, the loss of life, because that, that is the primary the primary way we encounter death, isn't it? And it comes to mind. And, and that is a valid form of death, that is physical death. And that's in scripture. But when scripture talks about death, and I think this may be helpful to try and understand what Paul's saying here, because I don't know whether whether it's easy to think, well, how do I put something to death? Might not really help me <coughs> thinking about what do I need to do, how do I need to do it? But rather understand if we put the word there, which actually in scripture, death is always to do with separation. And that's true of physical death, isn't it? The pain we feel when we lose somebody is because we are now no longer with them, we are separated from them. And that body, which was their shell, with their spirit and soul, the spirit and soul has left them and we're left with an empty shell. There has been a separation in that physical death. And in fact, the very first death that happens, isn't it, in Genesis 2, is where God says, you know, don't eat of the tree of good and evil, because what? You will surely die. Well, when Adam and Eve ate of that tree, they didn't die in that physical sense, did they? Not straight away, eventually they did. But actually what happened instantly was a spiritual death. And it's really strange when you start to think about this because the lie they were told was that if you eat of that tree, you'll be like God. In fact, they were already like God and they were less like God after they'd eaten of the tree than they were before. So don't believe the lie that something you can do is gonna make things better. Because that is a lie of Satan. And we'll come on to that a little bit later. But they died spiritually instantly. They felt the need to cover themselves and clothe themselves. Instantly there was a separation of them from God. And that direct communication they had where they walked with him in the cool of the evening, it says in scripture. So there was, there was physical death, there's spiritual death. And you know, there's this thing called a, a second death, that after death comes judgment. And on that judgment, it says that you know we'll be judged and there will be an eternal separation from God and this is called the second death. It's eternal death. So we have spiritual death, physical death, eternal death. All of them are separations. Be separated from. You're separated from God spiritually. You're separated from God eternally. We're separated from people. And even in the parable of the Good Samaritan, what happens when the son comes back? What does the father say? You know, the son who's taken his inheritance, disappeared, squandered it all, and then wants to come back. He says, my son who was dead. So you see, my son whom I was separated from has returned. But that was like a death, it was a, a separation. And when you read these things in scripture, when you read about death, it's separate from. So we can, Therefore, consider your members of your earthly body separate to, separate yourself from the sexual immorality of the culture. Separate yourself, come away from these evil thoughts, this, this, uh, you know, this, this whole culture that's harmful to you. And so God is saying, by putting to death, he said, he's not going to be killing your body. There is nothing like that in it. It's not about to separate yourself from. Come away. Don't allow it to have dominion over you. Because it's a lie, isn't it, of our culture. Our culture is similar in terms of its sexual uh, freedom that people are often told, you know, have your sexual freedom, be who you want to be, do what you want to do. You know, if it's okay, it's fine. If it's not hurting anybody, it's fine. And yet in our society, we're seeing more and more issues as we become more and more free, we see more and more problems. So like the lie that Satan told in the first place, that go on, it'll be good, you'll be more like God. The lie that the more you exercise freedom will bring you joy and peace, actually it's bringing hardship, concern, <coughs> pressure and stress. 
because it's a lie that society is being told and becoming more and more prevalent. You know, God designed sex. God designed it, and he said it's like, <laughs> this is an analogy, sex is like a fire, which sounds exciting, it is exciting. Sex is like fire, and fire is a good thing when it's in the right place. A fire in the fireplace is exciting and good. A fire in a wood burner is fine and a good thing. But what is fire like when it gets out of control? Terrified. And it's the same with sexual impurity. There is sexual purity in a relationship between a husband and a wife. But once it gets out of control and becomes outside of marriage, becomes between two same-sex partners, when it becomes something that's just a free-for-all, then it's like a fire that is out of control and it just leads to problems. Malcolm Muggeridge went as far as saying the orgasm has replaced the cross at the centre of religion for our culture today. That people are just tracing sexual freedom rather than looking to Jesus. God wants sexual relationships but in the context of marriage. And he knows what damage it can do. So when he says separate yourself from, it's not a separation for the purposes of, of holding you back. It's actually a separation for the purposes of your good. You know, it's like a door. If you see a doorway that says, do not enter, danger, do not enter. You might think, oh, I'm going to enter. But if you see a sign that says, danger, do not enter, high explosives, you understand the reason why <laughs> not to enter. And all the do nots in scripture, do not do this, are because there's high explosives inside there for our protection and to, to protect us from the harm that these things do. And so this, the, the warning is, die to, separate yourself from. And that's there for our good, not for our harm. So it's an obligation of something we then have to think through. Well, I've given my life to Jesus. I said I'm going to serve him. And this is one of the things that Paul then says we need to do. We need to change our lives. Now, why does Paul say that? Well, he actually, up there, he gives you the two reasons why. Verse 6. The wrath of God is coming against immorality. The wrath of God is coming against impurity. The wrath of God is coming against he would desire and everything that sets itself up against him. So that's the first reason. We don't want to stand in the wrath of God, but rather in the blessing of God. And secondly, he says, because that's what you used to be like. But you don't want to be like that anymore. You need to live a new life and a new way and walk a new way. So there is obligation in scripture. There is, it's an imperative and a response to, not an earning favour for. And that's why Paul always does his letters that way round, of putting the doctrine first and then saying, now, now what are you going to do? This is the appropriate response. You know, there's over 100 therefores in the various letters that Paul wrote and in the epistles. And Jesus used the word therefore many many times one of them he says is therefore having heard this doctrine you have no excuse he says therefore do not let sin reign in your body even if you can't say well i can't sin if jesus has done it because that was one of the arguments that paul came up against well if if if, if jesus paid the price and um, i'm not judged for my sin I, I might as well just carry on singing he says well that is no way to respond to the gospel Therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And in Romans, Paul goes a step further with this. Because he tells us this is not something we do of ourselves, but we do by the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us make these changes in our life. Therefore, <coughs> it does not depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. You know, we're going to come to communion now. This is what we're here for.
this in a sense is an obligation this morning. I think one of the groups brought it up said, you know, there is an obligation to do not forsake meeting together. So in a sense, you're fulfilling an obligation this morning. This isn't the only way you fulfill that obligation. But Jesus also said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Because it brings us back to the cross. It brings us back and reminds us that we're not doing it because we've got something good of ourselves, but rather because Jesus did all the good for us.